all things are yours. These are the words that Paul gives to the Corinthian church and that we'll be looking at today. All things are yours. Now, it sounds too good to be true. It sounds like something you would get from a prosperity gospel preacher, doesn't it? All things are yours. Prosperity gospel being that false teaching that says that God, if you are in Jesus, by somehow channeling your faith properly, you can exercise control and authority over circumstances to avoid misfortune or to escape from misfortune or to bring prosperity in this day and age. That's not what the Bible teaches and we don't teach it here. But this quote is not from a prosperity gospel preacher. It's from the Apostle Paul, a message to the Corinthian church. And it's far better than anything prosperity gospel has ever taught. Because this is saying you don't have to exert control over circumstances, but God, in his sovereignty from before time, has been moving circumstances to bless his children. All things are for you, for the glory of God. Even the bad things, he would use them all. And this is a promise he gives to everyone who is found in Jesus Christ. And this is good news. All things are for you. He is telling the Corinthian church here, you do not need a status. You do not need to argue among yourselves. You do not need to elevate yourself. You are in Christ. All things are already yours. There is no status you need to add to it. And my prayer is, as we look at this truth, that we would live in the light of it, that we would be transformed by it, that we would worship in thanksgiving because of it, and that we would be bold to serve Him because of this truth. Let's pray to that end. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You that even before time, Your grace has measured all that we would come to and all that we'd experience for our benefit and for your glory. God, we ask you to transform us <clears throat> by this truth. We are helpless to see and understand truth apart from your spirit, so we ask you to bring it here today that we might see you clearly, be transformed by your truth so that more glory can be had through our lives. And we ask this prayer in confidence because we ask it in the name of the risen Savior and the reigning King who stands right now at the right hand of the Father, holding all things and all circumstances together for the glory of God, which is always the good of his people. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we are continuing our study of 1 Corinthians. If you will, go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We're going to finish off that chapter today. As you're flipping there, by way of reminder, <clears throat> the book of 1 Corinthians was written by Paul about 54 AD. He was living in Ephesus at the time. Uh, he was writing a letter responding to concerns the Corinthian church had. And by all counts and measures, he was writing to a very immature church. But he is stating they are believers. Uh, there is a church there. They love Jesus. Uh, and it says there in uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 7 to 8, he tells them, you are not lacking in any gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ who will sustain you to the end, guiltless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ our Lord. He's talking to believers, but he had strong words for them. They were not living like, uh, they were living more like the world. Uh, they were not being transformed by the truth uh, that they were receiving. And Paul is addressing uh, the, many of the leaders in the church. They're attempting to elevate themselves. Thereby, he is seeing uh, that, they, their teaching 
basically, they were, they were elevating themselves based on their teaching and their doctrine. Uh, it was resulting in divisions, strife, and jealousy. So Paul begins a plea to the church, uh, and we're going to see him continue this. But he begins this plea in chapter 1, verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. So far, as we've looked at this, this book, we have seen Paul uh, address these things. He said they're applying worldly wisdom, not spiritual wisdom. He has said they are immature in Christ. Uh, he says because they are walking not by the Spirit, but by the flesh. And last week's sermon... Uh, last week's passage we looked at, Paul cautions the church, saying the church is God's and is precious to him because the church is a dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. So if you, talking to the church, talking to the leaders specifically, do not build carefully on the foundation of Christ, you're in danger of losing the reward God would give you when you stand in his presence. In essence, he's saying build according to God's standard. Because God is the one, not you, he's the one that's going to be judging your work. Now he's continuing uh, this argument, this time saying, you are going to be judged by God's standard. So don't stand before him with worldly wisdom. Now let's read our passage, 1 Corinthians 3, 18 to 23. Let no one deceive himself... If anyone among you thinks that he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise that they are futile. So let no one boast in men. For all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are Christ's, and Christ is God's. Now, let's make, looking back to the verse 18, we're going to make some textual observations. I have three key points that I want us to take away from here. I will not tell you the number of sub-points that I have to avoid scaring you away or out. Let's go back to verse 18. Let no one deceive himself. If anyone among you thinks he is wise in this age, let him become a fool that he may become wise. Point one, do not deceive yourself. The world's wisdom can never gain you favor from God on judgment day. The world's wisdom can never gain you favor from God on judgment day. If anyone among you thinks he is wise, he begins... And Paul knows many of them think they are wise. This is why the division started. They were elevating themselves, thinking, applying worldly wisdom uh, to advance their goals in ministry and their work in the church. Now, when he does this, he is really reemphasizing a point that he has already made. Remember, this is part of the same letter. We break things up in verses, and sometimes we need to take a step back to grab it. But he starts this argument in 1 Corinthians 1.18... For the word of the cross is folly for those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. He continued in 1 Corinthians 2, 2. For I decided to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. He's saying you need wisdom from Christ. You need wisdom from the cross. In 2, 12, he continues, now, that you have, now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things given freely to us by God. And we impart this in words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. 
Here he is saying, reemphasizing what he'd said before, it is better for you to become a fool in the eyes of the world to embrace the cross. The cross, which says we must embrace our desperate need for Jesus Christ. We must not put our hope and faith in what we can achieve in our status before men. We need to embrace the fact that we are broken and sinners, and we need to place our hope and faith in the work of Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection for us and all who believe. He is calling them, like Paul mentions in Romans, don't be conformed to this world. Don't follow the foolishness of worldly wisdom. It will gain you nothing. Embrace Christ and follow the Spirit. Galatians 5.16 says, I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. I want to jump down to uh, Galatians 5.22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Verse 24. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Verse 26, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Isn't it interesting? And we see in 1 Corinthians 3.3, 3, that was exactly what was going on, this last bit. Divisions, jealousy, and strife were what was going on in the 1 Corinthian church. The flesh is always telling you to protect yourself, to advance yourself. And the Spirit is saying, whatever you do for me, do with my character. Submit to the Spirit. Embrace Christ for your salvation and submit to the Spirit and reflect His heart in all that you do. So what is Paul saying here? But re-emphasizing you do not gain anything from worldly wisdom. Better to be thought a fool in the eyes of the world. Embrace Christ and submit to the Spirit. But he adds a little something to that. Verse 9, for the wisdom of the world is folly with God. Now he is adding, don't just fail, to, don't live like a fool in this world. Don't practice worldly wisdom, which is foolishness in the world. But now he is saying this. Don't stand before God on judgment day with the wisdom of the world. Now, look at that, that phrase, with God. For with, verse 19. For the wisdom of this world is folly with God. It's not just folly to God, which is kind of a point he had already made, but with God. With meaning before or in the presence of God. What he is saying here is before the throne of God. So he has already emphasized, don't act a fool in your life. Walk in spiritual wisdom. Now he's saying, don't appear before God on judgment day as a fool. Galatians 3.11 is using that same word. It says, now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law, for the righteous shall live by faith. That's the same word, before God. Saying, you, no one is going to stand before the throne of God and be justified by the law and the works thereof, or any human work, but justification comes by faith. So Paul is adding this point. Better to look a fool in the eyes of the world then stand before God on judgment day as in your foolishness. So he says, so he turns. For it is, now he continues this point in verse 19. For it is written, he catches the wise in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows the thoughts of the wise, that they are futile. Now, he catches the wise in his craftiness. This is a quote from Job. It's actually... Eliphaz, one of the friends of Job. Now, he said a lot of things that actually weren't right, but he did get one thing that was right. He makes a point to say that God frustrates the intentions of the fool, and the fool is the one that does not do the will of God. 
The next, the next reference in quotes is Psalm 9411. Now, Psalm 9411 reads, The Lord knows the thoughts of men that they are futile, but a breath, useless. Paul inserts in place of, of men the wise. As he's continuing, he's saying, You men think you're wise. The wisdom of men, the greatest and best wisdom of men of this world will give you nothing. So to the audience in, in Corinth hearing this, they are being brought before the throne of God with the idea of this. Do you want to stand before God on judgment day and have all of your futile, wasted plans be revealed before him? Or do you want to look a fool in the eyes of the world and embrace spiritual wisdom? For those that love Jesus, that would be telling. For those that don't know Jesus, that were sitting perhaps in that congregation listening to that letter read, it would have a similar effect. Am I ready to stand at all? Have I embraced Jesus? Or have I been pursuing things of this world? And now we come to among the most profound and amazing verses in the Bible. That first point being concluded, do not be deceived. The world's wisdom can never gain you favor from God on judgment day. Point two, God directs that all things work for the benefit of his children. So let no one boast in men. At the end of, this is verse 21. For all things are yours whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or present or future, all are yours. This great crescendo in his argument here saying, do not be divided. Don't boast in men. Do not look to the status of the world. You need to add nothing to what you already have because all things are already yours. God directs all things. Work for the benefit of his children. All things are yours. What is that saying? For your benefit. Designed, allowed, or orchestrated for your benefit. That these things, all things, are made in some way to serve you as God's child. This is the Romans 8.28 of 1 Corinthians. A very similar concept is shared there. For we know... That all things work together for God, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. But here in verse 22, now he's going to unpack that a little bit more for us. All things are yours, he says. And then directly in answer to the people who are being divisive, he says this, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas, who were those names? Those are leaders in the church. Paul and Apollos were both in Corinthian, in Corinth. They were part of helping to grow that church. Apollos had already left at the time, but then he says Cephas. Now, who is Cephas? That's Peter. We don't have any record that Peter was ever at this church. So he is saying categorically, all things are yours. The leaders, some of whom you are aligning yourself under as though that gives you status, those are for you. They are already yours. There's no need to be divided here. These are people that are for you. They are for your blessing. Hebrews 10, 24 tells us what the church is for. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. All the more as you see the day drawing near. What are we to do? What is the church for? For building you up. Don't divide yourself. Don't add status to one another. You are for one another. The church is for you. Embrace that. Serve together. Build one another up. You don't need to add anything to yourself or your status. That's what the church is for. But he doesn't just say the church is for you. He says the world is the next thing that he adds. Now, the world is used in the Bible in in many different contexts. 
Sometimes it means the pattern of the world, the sinful world, but frequently it also means everything in existence. I think that's probably what it's driving at here. The world, everything. It's very broad. But then he, he continues on. Life. Well, there's a lot of things that go on in our life. Let's break that down a little bit. He's now said the church is for you. The world, that's for you. Life, that's for you. What happens in our life? Psalm 139, 16. Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were, that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. Every day, intentionally crafted by God. How important is it for us to step into every day knowing that was designed by God for his glory with us in mind, that we might glorify him? His day is intentional. I've been trying to pray that in the mornings when I get up. God, this is your day. I need to work for you in it. I'm not orchestrating the day. I'm in it. You've made a place for me and a path to walk in it. And how much more effective are we for the Lord when we walk with that idea, looking for what he would have for us in the day? I was uh, having a discussion with one of my kids on Friday and I was trying to help that uh, child understand something, and I couldn't get there, and I, I got frustrated and irritated. Well, that, that came up earlier, or later in the day. And as I talked to him, I recognized this is something that has been a pattern. And when I saw it as an opportunity to talk to him about that, I recognized, wait, this is an opportunity for me to bless my son before I just saw it as an imposition and interfering with what I was doing. What, how much more effective would it have been if I had addressed it earlier? Because I saw it, this event, this is for me. So I wanted to practice this idea that all things are for me, asking the question, was something unfolded, this is for me, and that's when the dogs got out. The fence was left open. And the puppy was gone. Our newly adopted puppy. We didn't actually put the name on the tag yet. So I start barking orders out to the family to start the search and rescue party. And I started driving. And as I was driving, I said, this is for me? This is for me. Yes, it's for me. I said, but Lord, it needs to be for me in a way that we find the dog. Because if we don't, the kids are going to cry. And this would be a horribly depressing sermon illustration on Sunday. I might cry myself, and I'm not secure enough in my masculinity to handle that. So can we just find the dog, please? Well, we did find the dog, and then my daughter and I drove around to find all the people that were helping us. Say, Wait, look, we found her. We drove up to the UPS guy. We got her. I found the bicycler that I had talked to before. He said, I drove seven miles looking around for your dog. Well, we got her now. It was like the parable of the lost sheep. Now, we can exhaust ourselves attempting to figure out what God is doing in everything, but that's not what we need to do, but to recognize God does have all things for us. And when we at least recognize that, we can have a dialogue with him in the midst of what may be incomprehensible. I need to hit a few other things here. I pro- this will take, and I want to do this quickly. I want you to relax because uh, I can't help myself. There are some elements in Scripture that make very clear how God blesses us in this life in ways that we would not see them as blessings. I want to hit some of those right now. First, every good thing is from God in life. James 116, don't be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation and shadow due to change. It's interesting. He starts the same passage with do not be deceived. We have a tendency to credit ourselves or other people for things that are good. Don't be deceived. If it's good, it was a gift from God in life for you by God's blessing. God's blessings are for us in life. What about work? Is work painful? It is a four-letter word, and it feels like it more often than not. 
But that's for us too. God uses it to provide, but it's not just using it to provide, it's an opportunity to serve him. Colossians 3.23 Whatever you do, work heartily as to the Lord and not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive your inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. When we look at it as not in our way, and I've done that so much of my life, that work is in my way and stopping me from serving the Lord, it's a cumbrance. But it's for us that we might serve him. Uh, after my, my dad passed away, uh, there was a story from somebody that worked for him that whenever he gets coffee, he would draw a cross on the cup. And he'd walk around at work with the cross on his cup. And this coworker said, it was always such a blessing. I immediately thought of Christ when he came in. How many conversations would that have started? How many opportunities do we have when we look for it? Do we see in work opportunities to bless and serve the Lord? That is for us, opportunities to serve there. Wait, um, okay. Right, I got it work, it provides for the family. What about the trials? Yes, trials in life are for you. James 1, 2, count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Trials are refining our faith that we might see and love and serve our Lord even more. The trials are for us. What? Wait a second. What if someone is attacking us because of our faith? Yes, that's for you too. Matthew 5, 11, Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great. Where? In heaven. So they may, so, for so they persecuted the prophets before you. Prosperity gospel would land everything in this world. There is a much greater world coming. And even when they persecute you, that is for you and for your reward. What, what about suffering? Well, it's, it's not because of my faith. Well, there are two blessings there. 2 Corinthians 1.3. Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction. What a beautiful promise there. And you submit to him in your suffering, he will bring you comfort. Look to him. He will meet you there and comfort you. It continues though, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort we ourselves are comforted by God. Not only will he meet you in your suffering, he will use your suffering to equip you to bless someone else who is also in suffering, allowing you to point them to Christ. Life. The church, the world, life, and all that it contains for you because of his great love for you. But then it continues. Death. Death is in the list too. Is it really that comprehensive? Is that designed and packaged to serve us? Well, what do you think? Yes. What about when our loved ones die? My father died of early onset Alzheimer's. You've heard me reference that in the past. And that illustrated for me how loving our God was to shepherd my father through those final stages, illustrating what real love and faithful love is through the work and faithfulness of my mother and the faithfulness of the church as they supported my mother through those days. I also think, oh, but it also, it, it makes me that much more excited about the reunion that we will have. So when I think of death, I think, I'm going to see my father again. I think of Mike Hall, you remember him? Mike Hall, a few weeks away from his death, came with us to hand out Christmas presents to some foster children. And I remember him standing there and talking to the kids. I don't know why this is happening to me, but I know I can trust God through it. A few weeks later, he was with Jesus. What kind of testimony is that for those kids? 17 foster kids in one family, pretty amazing. 
What about our deaths? I also was reminded uh, that when my, my uncle Ted passed away, as he was in the last weeks, uh, he would repeat this phrase, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. He was quoting Philippians 1.21. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall, yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. The passage continues, the point is clear. While we are here, he gives us opportunities to work for him, for which we may receive a reward. And ultimately, when death comes for those in Christ, it is the gateway to step into the presence of our Savior. Even death and the manner of death designed to serve those who are in Christ. The passage continues. Now we have the church, we have the world, we have life, we have death, the present or the future. We've talked about many things that might happen in this world and the present, but what about the future? Romans 8, 15. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him. For I consider that the sufferings of the present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us as co-heirs with Christ, those who are in Christ stepping into the presence of God. What do we have to look forward to? A resurrected, glorified body in a restored creation. Realization of every promise. Reunion with Jesus Christ and all those that have gone before in Christ. The future glorified. What an inheritance! What a promise! Point three, being in Christ by God's grace through faith is everything and the only status that matters. Verse 23, all are yours and you are Christ's and Christ is God's. All are yours. This is almost like the why why are all yours? Because you are in Christ. In Christ, by grace, through faith, because of his death, burial, and resurrection in your place, you are made righteous. You have the Holy Spirit of God indwelling you when you place your hope and faith in him. He loves you as he loves his son, he as his own child. You have standing before God because of the work of Jesus Christ, not because of your effort. And you don't need anything else that this world has to offer. You don't need to add any status to it. All things are already yours. I'm, uh, I'm now in my 50s, so I am slightly past due for a midlife crisis. And I have considered lately that I don't have a name that is going to be remembered aside from those in my family. I, uh, I thought near the last half of my career in the Air Force that there was going to be some things where I could make a big impact there. It didn't quite happen that way, and I retired, and within about five minutes, the active duty force forgot I ever existed. So I didn't make an impact in the military that will last beyond my time. I also have not made an impact in my profession. I'm a lawyer. Have you been injured in an accident? <laughs> well, if you have, and then you went to the local bar associate and said, I need the best lawyer, they're not going to suggest me. And if you said, well, what about Stephen C? They're going to say, who? Now, in the office where I work, everybody loves me. And what's not to love? But the fact is, I've made no impact in my career that's going to last beyond me. I love to serve I 
I love to serve God's people. And it is among the greatest privileges that I have to be able to share God's word with you. But there are those in ministry that have this record that will last long beyond them. Imagine all of the views and hits that John Piper gets. I, I, you go to another church and say, have you considered having Stephen C. A preach at your church? They're going to say, who? I, uh, last year, near the fall, I, I poured my heart into a sermon, and I was so excited to have, to have done that. And uh, a few months later, I went back to see, I wonder, uh, let me check the YouTube site. I wonder how many people have been blessed. 63 views. Nobody shared it, and one person liked it, and that was me. <laughs> I did like it. My flesh would say, I want to make an impact in this world so that they will remember me for centuries. But they won't. And it doesn't matter. Because my Savior will remember me for eternity. Because of His work. Always because of His work. I want to close with reading Ephesians 1.3. An amazing truth that he has orchestrated things for his people. Ephesians 1.3 says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will and to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved, that is Jesus Christ. He has done it all in Christ we don't need to fight for status. We don't need to be remembered because he remembers us. All things are for us because through the ages our God has been for us. God sending Jesus Christ into this world to take our sin upon himself, to die in our place on the cross, to rise again, that we might have eternal life by grace through faith. Jesus Christ having taken our sin now standing at the right hand of the Father, interceding for us, the Holy Spirit entering in us that we might know Him, that we might follow Him, that we might know the difference between being wise and being a fool. And it is not what the world would tell you. The Spirit empowers us to live for Him. And as we close... Let's be reminded that God's word is always instructive to us, and it should always transform us. Transform how we worship in the light of that truth. Transform how we live in the light of that truth. Are you worshiping in thanksgiving because of this truth? Are you walking in circumstances of your life saying, this is for me, because God in this is for me? Are you resting knowing you don't have to control the circumstances around you, but just walk faithfully in it because he is orchestrating things for you, for his glory, and the glory of God is our best good. Are you seeing opportunities around you? Are you walking through opportunities that are inexplicable knowing this is for me, he's with me? How much more effective would we be if we walked in the days knowing this is true, I'm in his day. He constructed. He has a footpath for me through this day for his glory. And yes, that is for my good. Do you know Jesus as your savior? This promise is for those who have put their hope and faith in Jesus Christ. Depending on his work, not theirs. Have you put your hope and faith in him? I'm going to lead us in a closing prayer, and I want to encourage you 
to pray that God would transform you, and I will be available afterwards to pray with you, and you'll be available afterwards to pray with you. This is God's temple because His people are assembled here. And I would encourage you to pray with God's people that we might glorify Him by being transformed by His truth. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank You. Thank You. Thank you that before time you have thought of us. Thank you that you've done the work that we could not do. And God, we can't even without your help see you as glorious. We thank you for doing that work as well and drawing us to yourself. God, will you make us thankful because of this truth? Will you make us rest in the world because of this truth? Will you make us bold to serve you because of this truth? Will you lead us to repent where we may be seeking worldly wisdom and worldly status and putting our confidence in worldly things, that we might depend fully on you and submit fully to the Spirit so you can be glorified fully in our life and all the moments therein until we stand in your presence and see your face. Be glorified. In this, your church. And we ask this prayer in confidence in the name of our slain yet risen Savior and reigning King who stands right now at the right hand of the Father holding all things together for His glory, which is our good. In Jesus' name.